Welcome to today's Advent Reflection. In the Law of Moses, it, parents were required to go to the temple some six or seven weeks after the birth of a baby to carry out cleansing rituals. So that's why we find Joseph and Mary and Jesus at the temple in Luke chapter 2. There they meet two senior citizens, Simeon and Anna. Anna was an 84-year-old widow who'd given her life to worship and prayer in the temple. Luke gives us just a short account of their meeting, which goes like this. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And that word redemption is the theme for our reflection today. I don't know about you, but redemption and redeeming are not words that I come across much in day-to-day -day conversation. Those who have a mortgage might be looking forward to the day they can redeem it and be free from monthly payments. Sometimes we might talk about someone having a redeeming feature, by which we mean something that makes up for all the things that we don't quite like about them. Someone once said the past is like a different country, they do things differently there. They also think differently there, and they talk differently there. So for us to understand the significance of the word redemption for the Bible writers, we need to understand a little bit more about the society and culture they experienced and lived in. At the time Jesus was born, Judea was governed by the Roman Empire, which was loathed by the Jews. It's quite possible that when Anna talked about the redemption of Jerusalem, she actually meant the release of the free, freeing of Jerusalem from Roman rule. Certainly later in the Gospels, we come across the mistaken view that the Messiah would be a military or political leader who would free Judea from the Roman rule. In the Old Testament, there are times when God intervenes to redeem or rescue his people. For example, from in the exodus from Egypt, or the return from exile in Babylon. Both from their history in the Old Testament and their lived experience under the Romans, people knew the reality of what it was like to be enslaved and oppressed by a foreign nation. And that's not an experience that many of us have had, although we have met people from Ukraine who've had that experience recently. As for individuals, if people fell into financial debt, they could be required to sell themselves and their family into slavery. Their way out of slavery would but they could be bought, their freedom could be bought by a member of their wider family who would pay a ransom. This person was known as the kinsman redeemer. They'd pay a ransom to buy back the freedom of their family member or members. And if you want to find out more, you can read a little bit in Ruth about how that role of kinsman redeemer worked. And of course, a common feature of life at this time was the buying and selling of slaves in the marketplace. Slaves had no rights, no property, nothing of their own, and they could only at best dream of one day being free. Again, that's not experience that many of us have, although modern day slavery is still an issue for many. In the New Testament, Paul and others write about people being slaves to sin, being held captive by it and by their sinful nature. Those who struggled with bad habits or addictions know how controlling they can be. No, ma no matter how hard we might try, we can never quite break free of them on our own. Paul writes about this at length, particularly in Romans chapter 6 and 7, for example this passage. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. But there is good news. It commences in the Christmas story, it's confirmed at Easter, and it will be completed on the day that Jesus returns. This good news is the possibility of redemption, of freedom, of being rescued by Jesus. Interestingly, the New Testament doesn't talk about Jesus as Redeemer, but instead talks of him as Saviour. Mark writes that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many and the many includes you and me. The author of Hebrews wrote, Jesus has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. The ransom was the sacrifice of himself. So at the first Christmas, at the culmination of the ages, at just the right time, 
Jesus came with the intention of giving his life as a ransom to redeem us, to rescue us. He paid a price we could not pay, to rescue us from an enemy we could not conquer. No wonder the angels were celebrating in the skies over Bethlehem that night. But the news gets even better. Not only are we redeemed from slavery to sin, there's more to this gift than meets the eye. In Galatians 4, Paul describes it this way. So we were in slavery under the basic spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. God adopts us as his children. We are part of his family. And the thing with both redemption and adoption is that they're a permanent change of status. They don't depend on what we do or how we feel. It's all in the gift. They're dependent only on the grace of God given freely to us. As Paul puts it, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So what should our response be? Well, like Simeon and Anna, we're called to honour God with our lives and our lifestyles, our prayers and our worship. You are not your own, Paul writes. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. With our whole lives, our lifestyles, our attitudes, every part of us. Giving worship to God for the freedom that we enjoy. I wonder, what does that look like for you? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the redemption, the rescue, the freedom that we enjoy through the sacrifice of Jesus. Help us, Lord, each and every day to enjoy that freedom, to live in that freedom and not to let ourselves be trapped again in slavery to sin, to attitudes, to bad habits. Lord, let us enjoy your grace each and every day, we pray. Amen.